We are in the middle of a series that we're doing for Advent um, that I'm calling Emmanuel, and it's focused on um, what, is it, what does it mean to us that Christ came near? Um, how does that impact and change our lives? Um, and I want to start today just by letting you all know that I'm in the middle of a quest. Um, it started off as just a simple shopping for presents. Um, and I went, I had two presents in mind for my lovely wife. Um, and she bought both of them for herself. So, <laughs> um, oh. so the quest is on. And then there's my mom who doesn't need a single thing in the world and just wants me to love her. Um, but it's hard to find the perfect present for her. And so um, this long pursuit is, is taking me into dangerous places. Um, places where angels fear to tread. Uh, <laughs> things like Bellevue Square. Um, <laughs> which this time of year um, brings great fear and consternation to me. Um, but we are on a quest as well. Uh, we're here this morning because we're on a quest. Um, we're on a quest for life. We're on a quest for connection to other people and to God, and we're on a quest um, for God, to get to know Him better, and to maybe make the world a better place while we're at it. Um, a friend of mine posted her status, um, Janet, who, Janet um, Fairwolf, who used to come here for a bit, um, she posted her status this week and it said, I just want to be a doper person, which doper meaning better, um, and I thought, that's a good pursuit right now. That would be really cool. Um, but I want to be the type of person, and I think you all want to be the type of people who are getting better and not worse, and who are getting kinder um, rather than more bitter and, and more gracious than rather than more ruthless with each other. Um, and so as we pursue this quest, connecting with each other and God and loving Him and loving others, um, we're going to look at some other guys who were on a quest, and we just sang about them, but it's the, it's the wise men who came from the east. Um, and so you can find that story in Matthew chapter 2. Um, if you want to pull out a Bible, or you can listen to me read it, that's fine too. Um, and we're going to read the first uh, 12 verses of it. It says that after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is this one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. And when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all of Jerusalem with him. And when he had called together all the people's chief priests and the teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. He said, In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time that the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and he said, Go and search carefully for the child. And as soon as you find him, report it to me so that I too might go and worship him. And after they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen when it rose ahead of them uh, went on until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. And on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary. And they bowed down and worshipped him. And then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Pray. God, we're on a quest to know you, to love you, and to love others. And I pray that you would guide us as we consider this scripture. I pray that you would direct us and that you would connect with us on what's going on in our lives right now. And that you would speak your words. That the things that are of you would be planted deep in our hearts. And that we would respond to them. And the things that are not would be blown away like chaff. So, speak to us now, Lord. We love you. The question um, that I've been toying with this couple of weeks is, is how are we going to respond to the Advent? Advent means arrival. How are we going to respond to the arrival of God in our lives? And Matthew um, does something really, really beautiful in his gospel. The first chapter, he introduces us to Jesus. 
It says, this king has come. And then chapter 2 is this story with a whole bunch of different characters showing up and encountering the news that Jesus has arrived. Um, and they each represent, I think, a different way that we can respond to God. Um, these wise men had traveled likely for months to come and see this child. They aren't sure where to go at some point. The star wasn't leading them um, as much as they would have probably liked, and so they headed to the palace. And upon coming to the palace, I think they probably expected to find a throng, like a parade happening, um, a newborn son, maybe of the king Herod. Uh, but that wasn't what they found. They found a bunch of people who had no clue what was going on. And they began to ask questions. Um, and they encounter Herod. He's an interesting cat. Um, he was the governor of Galilee for about 35-ish years at his, his reign and his life ended sometime around the time that Jesus was born. And he was um, known for great accomplishments, but not for being a great guy. He was paranoid um, and ruthless in protecting his throne. He um, killed family members without hesitation if he thought that they were plotting against him. And his attempts to get more information from the Magi were, were twofold. One, when, when did you see that star appear? And, and they told him two years before. And then um, the other thing was that they might go make a careful search and then come back to him. And, and if they had brought him that news, he would have rushed to the site to kill Jesus. And his level of paranoia, his, his desire to protect his throne, is found in the next story in Matthew's um, gospel in which he kills all the baby boys that were born in Bethlehem in the last two years. They didn't return to him, they didn't give him the news, and so he didn't hesitate to kill every baby boy. Um, no fear of wiping out an innocent on the way to protecting his throne. It really represents the absolute extremes of the protection of self. And He's going to hold on to his power, and he's going to hold on to it tight. And surely that's not us. Except for this one little interesting line. The whole city was troubled along with Herod. There is a bit of trouble that comes to us with the idea that God might move in and mess with our life a little bit. Um, I had a tough week. I, um, I got in a bit of a spat with my niece. And I felt I was justifiably angry with her um, for her irresponsibility and her attitude she gave me. And um, God tried to nudge it out of me, and I could feel myself hold on to this thing and go, No! I have every right to be mad. Look at what she did. And then my wife had to come and try and talk me out of it. And even that, I stiff-armed my wife for quite a while. Um, going, No! I, I have a right to this anger. And here's how I'm going to treat her as a result. Um, and eventually, I had to let it go. We had a nice talk and said things right yesterday. But it was just a reminder to me that um, I don't want to be like Herod, but sometimes I am. It is not unusual for us to grab a hold of something and to hold on to it so tightly and to worry that God might actually want us to do something else with it. There is a level of stiff arming that we do with God, and um, unless we want to be here, unless we want to hold on to a throne of self, be fearful, live with closed <coughs> hands, and gripping tightly to what is ours, it's not a good way to go. It's not, it's not going to let Jesus do what he wants to do in our lives, and we will miss out on life as a result. The second group of people who the Magi encountered um, were the scribes and the chief priests, um, which their only reaction was to know the right answers. Um, and then, if you actually think about the whole Gospels, um, they're pretty apathetic to what Jesus is doing, except when he gets popularity and threatens uh, the establishment as they know it and as they have a nice spot in it. And then they start to get very angry with him, and then they're the result of cross. So, um, but at this point in the story, 
these are the people who would have known the Bible the absolute best. And they do. Honestly, if you asked me to tell you what promises there are about the Messiah, I don't know if I would immediately jump to Micah 5, verses 2 and 4. Like, that, that is not in my matrix, and I've spent some time with the Bible. These guys were experts in knowing this stuff. And they know the right answer. They know where this baby is to be born. Um, but the weird thing is, <coughs> that's the end of their part in the story. They don't join the Magi in their journey. As far as we know, there's no account of them showing up. And um, it's an incredible little irony. You get these Magi who have traveled for months with just the guidance of a star. And then you have these guys who know exactly where to go from the scriptures. And they can't make the walk. Um, Bethlehem is exactly five and a half miles from Jerusalem. It is roughly an hour and a half of a journey. And they just don't take it. It's just not on the agenda for them. Uh, in my own life, I kind of feel like the spiritual life um, follows the laws of inertia. Um, Baron, please forgive me if I misquote the laws of inertia, or Jerry, I know that you both probably know this better than I, but um, things that are in motion have a tendency to stay in motion. Um, when we are active in our faith, when we're doing stuff with our faith, there is an excitement and a wonder and a desire to do more. Um, the adventure of being able to help a family with Thanksgiving um, made me really open to doing the adventure of what would it be like to help a family that's in transition? Uh, sometimes you stumble across a new book or a new interaction or uh, a new ministry possibility appears and, um, and we all kind of wake up and we get excited and we go, oh my gosh, look who God is. Look what he could possibly do. This is, this is really neat. Um, we get a lot of Honestly, even just the simple service of somebody else, having somebody over for dinner can help do that. Oh, she's got water on the way. We're okay, folks. But KBH is locked down. Okay. We're good. Um, but on the other hand, second law of inertia, something that is ground to a halt has a tendency to stay at a halt. Um, it's really easy to get in the doldrums of faith and to fall asleep. Um, and uh, in the process of that, the relationship with God becomes dead. Uh, it, it doesn't feel like it's moving. It fades to the back of our lives. And, and this season is so full of so much stuff to do. I don't know if your calendars are filling up, but mine feels frantic on the way here. Christina was like, oh my gosh, we need to make a list of all the things that we need to get done this weekend. Oh, by the way, it's Sunday. <laughs> and no joke, as the pastor, I told her, if you need to make that list during my sermon, feel free, because we got a lot of stuff to do. <laughs> we got a lot to do. And the reality is it's so easy for our faith to just kind of fade to the back of all the other things that we have going on. And it just becomes less and less a part of our lives. I have watched um, numerous friends who would definitely affirm that God is real and alive and a big deal um, for whom faith is not impacting their life in any way, shape, or form because it's faded to the back. And I think the Christian life actually dies more easily in a recliner than it does in the fires of struggle and doubt and wrestling with God over things. Um, when you're wrestling with God, you appear on the other side maybe a little bit wounded, but with a new understanding of Him. But when it's fallen asleep, it's scary times. Um, there's a weird story in Mark chapter 11. Um, it's, it's sort of near the end of Mark's gospel, and um, Jesus goes up to a fig tree, and He wants to have some breakfast. And so he looks for figs on it, and there's no figs on it. And he curses the tree. Um, 
And the disciples wake up the next morning and they look at the tree and it's withered and died. It is dead as a doorknob. Um, and the fig tree isn't cursed for having bad fruit. It's not cursed for making uh, fruit that was rancid. It's cursed for not having any fruit at all. Um, I don't think God judges us for making mistakes or for, for um, having things that we tried to do but failed at. But I think it's really scary when we don't do anything. I have found myself and heard a lot of dialogues in ministry about the importance of we just need to wait. And I'm reminded that God does not steer parked cars very well. So we will not wait. We will keep doing things and we will learn from the process. Um, I hope the same is true in our faith. I ran across a really interesting quote from a guy by the name of John Owen. He was a Puritan preacher, and he talks about um, apathy and the death, um, the death of the spiritual life. And here's what he had to say. He said, I won't judge a person to be spiritually dead, though I see him at the present in a spiritual swoon, like he's fainted. That's what a swoon is. He's fainted. Um, though I see somebody who has fainted, I will not judge him spiritually dead, and here's why. Because if you judge a person dead, you neglect them, you bury them, and you stay away from them. But if you judge them as fainting, you will use every means possible to bring them back. Um, imagine it, you're walking down the street, and you see somebody, and uh, they are laid out flat. If they're dead, Something has terribly gone wrong, and you don't want to be there. But if they passed out, wouldn't you want to stop? See if there's anything you could do. Maybe at least call 911 or, or check if they're breathing or something. We would do something. Um, and the same is true in our lives. When we feel something that has gone flat, it's really easy to be stuck there going, I guess it's dead. But it's not. It just needs to get woken up. Um, and the same is true with other people. It should concern us. One of the things that I love about this church is that um, we have small groups where people can get together. And we have regular gatherings of people where people are getting together not on some formal thing like a small group. And it's in the process of doing that together that we get woken up at the times that we fall asleep by each other. Um, I used to work at UPC. I worked at the front desk. And um, one of the dynamics of that was when it got really cold, like this time of year, there were homeless folks who would wander in. Um, and there was one rule, which was you cannot sleep in the narthex. You can't do it. Um, which, as I think about it, if I put myself in that person's shoes, they're freezing cold, and then they walk into a nice, warm, cozy environment. They haven't slept a lot because it was really cold the night before. And then we're going, the one thing you can't do is sleep. But you can get warm. So um, regularly they would fall asleep. And um, inevitably somebody would come to me and say, there's guys that sleep down there. And one particular day, um, one of the folks came and, and, and they saw somebody and said, you can't sleep here. And the guy was asleep. So they came to me at the, at the front desk and said, Chris, there's, there's somebody asleep down in the narthex. And I said, well, I can't leave this desk. And, uh, so I'll have to call somebody. And I called um, Nancy Schultz, who's a wonderful lady. And um, she went down there to go talk to the person and let them know that they couldn't sleep there. And as she talked to them, she realized something was wrong. And thankfully, she knew what she was dealing with. And the person was diabetic and had low sugar. Um, had Nancy not shown up, been concerned, ran and got some juice, it would have been a bad, bad situation. When we start to feel flat, when we see other people that are flat, do we judge them and go, those people, they don't even care about the reason for the season. Or do we try to revitalize them? Prayer, conversation, and investing in their lives. Wake them up. 
lots of things wake me up. Um, worship helps wake me up. Thanks, worship team. It means a lot to me. Um, I don't always walk in here spiritually on fire ready to preach. And this gathering does a lot for me. Small group, a good read. This holiday season, let's not let Jesus fade to the background. Let's not go into a lull. Because it's in the pursuit and in the seeking of him that we find life. There's one other um, crucial person in this story. Um, the main person, actually. The person who I think Matthew's encouraging us to be. And, and it's, it's the wise man. Verses 9 and 10. After they had heard the king, they went on their way. The star that they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. And on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and they worshipped him. And then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Um, they're led by God to Bethlehem. They are overjoyed. I love that description of what happened. When the star stopped and they knew they got, they were overjoyed. You want to find joy in your life? Look for Christ. They aren't the people that you would expect. Um, they weren't the most informed people. Uh, they were magi. Theologically, that's troublesome to me. They were astrologers. They were reading horoscopes to try to figure out what to do for the king. And they would watch the stars and they would go, well, that star looks like it's in a weird spot. That must mean something. And then they saw something that was completely unusual. Some uh, theologians think it might have been an angel or, or a star that just hadn't been there before. And they go, oh, a new king was born in Israel. we got to respond to that. we got to go and honor him. Um, God spoke to them in a very unique way that made sense to them, and they responded. Um, on the one hand, it's incredibly theologically troublesome that they didn't know their Bibles well enough to know where to look. But on the other hand, it's really encouraging because I can be pretty thick-headed with God sometimes. And the idea that God might be speaking in a way that we can understand Him, that He's drawing us and speaking to each of us, is incredibly encouraging. But all they did was respond. They sacrificed time and energy and what they were doing. They didn't even know exactly where to go. They, they seem a little confused at some point, so they just head to the palace. And God doesn't always inform us as much as we would like, does he, about what the plan is and what we are to do. Um, but they're on an adventure. Um, Jonathan has a great love of words, as do I. And he came up to me and he reminded me last week that, um, or actually informed me, I wasn't even reminded, that adventure comes from the same word as Advent. Advent means the arrival. Adventure means we're on a journey to an arrival. Something exciting is coming. We have no clue what it is at this point, but we're on an adventure and we'll see how this turns out. Um, we are on the adventure of faith. Uh, Eileen told me once that she thought the tagline for Harbor, the place for the adventurous spirit, she was like, that's horrible. That's not who these people are. But maybe John was on to something. Maybe the pursuit of God is a great adventure, and we have no clue what he's going to do. But he's going to do something pretty cool. And I want to be there to see it. They were looking, they were seeking, they were watching. God doesn't steer parked cars very well, but he steers guys who kind of don't know what they're doing, but are doing their best. Um, we don't get the info we need. We don't get all that we want, but we keep looking and watching and praying and acting. And somehow God makes something beautiful out of it. There's a myth about church that we somehow have to meet some bar before we come in the door, that we have to have it together, we get our ducks in a row, and then if we approach God the right way, with the right words, then we'll meet him. Um, 
And God doesn't seem all that concerned with whether we did it the right way as much as do we want to do it at all. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened unto you. Those are active things. So there's no room for judgment in us, but there's room for journey. Plenty of it. Want to go on a quest? Want to go on an adventure? See where God shows up? Um, the disciples were a mess of bad theology, by the way. They are as clueless as any one of us when it came to Jesus. And regularly they say absolutely stupid things. The thing I was reading this morning. Um, and this is after a good chunk of years of walking with Jesus. Um, they get in a fight over who is the best among them. Did they not at all see what Jesus was doing? Learn that humility uh, was part of the key? No. They're fighting about who's going to be the guy at Jesus' right hand. Because they're the best. Um, and Jesus always encourages them on, walks with them in their cluelessness, and says, you'll figure it out. Just stay on the journey with me. So don't give yourself don't give others a hard time when you don't get it right. Seek, pursue, try to get to know God better, and it will come. What might we do this season to meet God again? Um, I was digging through my books the other day, looking for something in particular, and I came across this old journal that I got from a church a long time ago, and um, it had like a read through the Bible plan, and a little way that I could like write a verse at the top and then what I thought about it. It was pretty simple. But I saw that and I'm like, huh, that's for 2018. I'm going to start that in January. I don't know if I'll make it all the way through. I wish I was disciplined and not ADD and like uh, some other folks I know who would do it every day. Christina just hit day 200 on her thankfulness journal. Um, I don't think I've ever hit day 200 on anything. <laughs> <laughs> But, we'll see. It's part of the journey. And as long as it's moving, I think I'll find him. Another thing about them was that before they ever offer him their gifts, they offer themselves. It says that he saw them bow down and worship him, and only then did they present the gifts that they brought. And there is a lot of times where I have gauged my faith off of all of my activities. And I have thought that God, God weighs me on a scale of, am I doing enough for him? Um, and that is a reminder that what God wants most of all is us. He wants to be in a relationship with us. And maybe as part of that, gifts of time and talent and resources. Um, and if that becomes part of our story, I think we'll get the same effect that they had. I already talked about it, overjoyed. That's a beautiful thing to have joy in your life. Um, they were also warned not to go back a different way. And that's significant. Um, they didn't head back to self. They didn't head back to apathy. They headed a different way, um, worshiping and celebrating. And I think part of that was the fact that what they received in the process of this was far greater than any of the gifts that they brought. Those gifts were incredible and valuable and just what this family needed for the next couple years. Um, but similar to our getting to help out this family, uh, the gift we get out of doing it is so much more than the sacrifice of doing it. And that seems to be a theme with God. The gift that the Magi gave her great, but what they found in the process was a God who would lead them, a God who protected them, a God who provided for them, and they got to watch salvation happen, eternal, abundant life. They got to look at God's face right in their face, God face to face. They got to see him. What's our gift to Christ? Ourselves, faith, seeking, responding. Offering of ourselves to him and his gift in response um, was himself. Life on the cross. Um, joy, grace, his provision for us, eternal abundant life, and the promise that one day we will see him face to face. And in the meantime, 
We will get glimpses that will bring us to life in ways we didn't even know were possible. Friends, I, like Janet, am so thankful to be on the journey with you. I love coming together to be with you. Um, and my hope and my prayer is that we can pursue Christ together. That we can not uh, follow him to ourself hold on to ourselves and what we want so much that we can't have space for God that we wouldn't get apathetic in the midst of the journey and think that we've already arrived. And that this season, especially, and the coming year, would be full of pursuing Christ and being surprised and overjoyed at what we find. Will you go on that journey with me? Okay, let's do it together then. Let's pray. <coughs> God, thank you for being you. Thank you for drawing near to us because there is no journey that we could take that would get us to heaven to see you face to face if it weren't for your coming to be with us first. God, we want to see you. We want to see your grace. We want to see your power. We want to see the joy that you have for us and the things you want to do in the world. And so God, help us to let go of the selfishness and the apathy that gets in our way of following you. Show us that next thing like you did with me in the bookcase of, of finding the next thing for us to take a journey towards. Help us to take that next step in pursuing you. Make us alive. We need it. We love you, Lord. Amen.